So today's the last bit of fracture mechanics, normal fracture mechanics, and that's the application to Weibull statistics. So we'll be talking about how uh, the fact that materials fail at different strengths actually affects materials in real life, particularly brittle materials. Um, and I'll go through the theory behind that and try to give some, some examples of it. Um, it's a little bit more of an abstract theory, so <coughs> it'll hope, I, I hope that it comes across clearly, but I'll try to make it more of a discussion than anything. Uh, I want to first share an article that Ben, before we get started, share an article that Ben shared with me yesterday on uh, fracture in the Salesforce Tower in San Francisco. So, why is it gonna, why is, why is it always gonna extend? Super annoying. Cool. So uh, this was a recent thing that happened. Salesforce Tower is the second largest building on the east on the west coast, um, and it was supposed to be a transit hub. Lots of buses and trains going through, uh, and a giant uh, part of the Salesforce empire. Uh, and after shortly after it construct it was constructed, they started seeing structural cracks starting to form in some of the beams inside of it. So in, in, there we go. So in some of the giant steel girders inside this structure, they started seeing these big brittle cracks forming in, in the structural steel. And so they had a whole team of, so this, this was a $2.2 .2 billion building um, that was a transit hub. And so it shut down transit in San Francisco for a while. Lots of buses and trains had to get rerouted. Uh, and they had a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of reworking to try to figure it out. They had whole teams of consultants and engineers and architects all figuring out what went wrong. Um, and it turns out that when they did the welds around these steel members, so welding, you have a high temperature that's going to change the crystallinity of the metal. And you actually started forming micro cracks around the weld sites. And those micro cracks, normally you're supposed to polish off um, because remember, cracks act as flawed nucleation points. So even if you have small cracks, those can eventually fatigued to grow into large cracks. So because they didn't polish those off in the fabrication, or after, after the welds, those cracks grew and started to split down the sides of these columns, mainly because of the bus and foot traffic kind of continuously loading the structures. And that fatigue from the, from the buses and, and people going by caused this catastrophic failure in the structure. And then another few hundreds of millions of dollars of repair um, yeah, and this, I think, just reopened in August of this past year. So this is not, this is not a, a, something long ago that happened. This is still a very prevalent phenomenon. So um, just thought that was a cool article. Thanks for sharing. Uh, so today we're going to talk about Weibull statistics. Actually, so to get us started on the discussion, I have a poll everywhere that I'm going to kick off with. So I'm going to switch right back to my laptop. And for this, I, I want you to think about the question, if I have a long rope and a short rope under the same weight, so same, some mass M being loaded on them, which one of these two is going to break first? Under the same applied load, ignore the self-weight of the structure. like there's some sort of consensus. Take a minute and talk to your neighbor about it and convince them why it would be one or the other. <coughs> uh, 
Uh, I wasn't sure. Because I can't really like make an argument for either. So. Might be the long one is because there might be more places where you can fail. Because I think since it's like forced along the same axis, so like all being like the force, the same force is applied to every single point, but in the short road, there's much less length. So there are less, less places for yeah. Unless it's like in this direction and anything supported like across the bank, then, then it would matter, but since it's all in one axis. Okay. Let's bring it back together. So who had thoughts about why this why one and why the long rope or short rope might fail first? Okay, that's good. How about anyone else? Other thoughts on this? No other thoughts. Nobody has any other thing. Thoughts on this. Um, yeah, so that's, that's actually exactly the right type of thinking. So it turns out this was an experiment performed, uh, I think originally by Leonardo da Vinci. There might've been somebody before him. Um, but there was this idea of, uh, so a rope is a collection of fi small fibers that are then woven together into a strand. And so the, in each of those fibers, you're going to have some probability of there being a weak point in them. And as you increase the length of those fibers, there's statistically going to be more and more points, uh, weak points in there. So um, the long rope statistically is, is more likely to fail first. It's not necessarily going to fail first, but there are because there are more potential sites for flaws, it, it could fail, or it's more likely to fail. So when we look at this now, uh, we can look at this uh, using this idea of Weibull statistics. So in this, uh, we start off our thinking with uh, a chain link. So if I have a long chain of some pieces of this chain going on. The probability of failure, probability of failure uh, is one minus the probability of survival. Uh, and that's for the whole chain, for some chain of length n. This is the probability of survival of any individual element, or the, the, this is the probability that any one individual element fails in this thing. So I say uh, if, if any link fails, then everything fails. So I can write this out mathematically using probabilities. How many of you, how many of you have taken some probability or statistics class before? OK, like half-ish. Um, you don't need to worry too much about the probability ideas. It's, it helps if you do, but um, that's not going to be the main point of this. So now if, because I have, if, if any link in here fails, the whole thing fails, this is uh, also sometimes referred to as a, a weakest link theory. So in brittle materials, the, the same type of idea applies. So if we now have, I don't know, some, say this is a, a carbon fiber um, that I'm now pulling in tension, there's going to be some random distribution of flaws, some large, some small, all in different orientations. Um, and then if in here there's some largest flaw that's going to that's going to act as a nucleation site, the failure of that flaw is going to cause this whole thing to rupture. And so now we can take a look at this. So now this is uh, particularly for a brittle material. So um, now for brittle materials, we're looking at the um, largest flaw size. We'll call it 
cause failure. So it's it's going to be the the weakest point in my in my fiber in my ceramic plate in my whatever that's going to cause this thing to to fail. And once that starts to go, it'll propagate through the rest of the structure, similar to how in a chain link, if I have any one of those chains fail, the whole chain fails. Um, so now I can say for this type of brittle material, the probability of failure failure is the probability in terms of a crack that I have some crack size larger than a critical crack. So the probability that the biggest crack is bigger than that critical crack size, which you remember hopefully from the last couple of days, uh, that the critical crack size is related now to the fracture toughness. Okay, I see divided by the far field applied stress squared. So now this, uh, this critical crack size depends on how much stress I'm applying to my material. So when we look at this, we can, we can apply some ideas from statistics to looking at distributions of flaws in materials. So I'm going to define a new probability distribution of flaws, so or a density distribution of flaws. Um, flaw density distribution. And that distribution I'm going to call G um, of A, where this G of A is some reference times A over A naught to some exponent here, to the minus lambda. So this is a, a, an equation for a normal distribution and what it looks like is the probability of there being a flaw of a certain size, A. There's gonna be some relative maximum there and it's gonna kinda of tail out. So now, um, if I take uh, I'm, I'm going to say that this is a density distribution. So if I take the integral of g of a from uh, 0 to infinity through all of the a's, then this is 1. So the, the whole area under this curve is 1. And if I take it now somewhere less than that, then I have something less than 1, some fraction of 1. Um, and now what I'm, what I'm basically looking for is if I have some distribution of flaws and I want to find the probability that there's a flaw that's greater than a critical flaw size, I need to say, okay, what is my critical flaw size? So I have some critical flaw size that's now um, dependent on my far field applied stress. And I'm going to say the probability of there being some flaw greater than that is the integral from AC to infinity of that G of A dA. So then this is the, the likelihood of um, some flaw A is greater than AC. And this is now the area after all of that. So, what we do now, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip skip some of the some of the mathematical steps here, um, but uh, make sure you get out of there. Okay, um, what we do now, yeah. Sorry, there we go. So what we do now is we can take this idea of a weak size, um, use some ideas from statistics, and say that this is actually equivalent to some um, e to the minus uh, n v. So this is this is related to some exponential function. Um, I use that exponential relationship, this distribution of flaws, the relation between my critical flaw size and fracture strength. I combine them all, take a couple integrals, um, 
And what I end up with is the probability of failure in a material. So there's some math. Do some math stuff. Uh, and eventually what I end up with is failure probability of a material, of now a brittle material, in terms of, I'm going to write this in terms of my stress and the volume of the part. Um, is 1 minus exp negative v over v naught sigma over sig sigma naught to some exponent. There we go. So, uh, the reason this pops up, I'm not actually going to go through the math, but I'm going to try to explain it qualitatively. So, if you imagine now I have some, some infinitely large part with all of the distribution of potential flaws. So I have some very small flaws in this thing, um, some larger flaws that I'm looking at. Da, da. I know the probability of failure is going to be dependent on that applied stress because that's going to change the that's going to change what uh, the critical crack size that I need to failure is. But then it's also going to be dependent on the volume of the part because that depends that changes uh, what the what the distribution of the flaws in this material are. So now what I'm essentially doing is uh, taking some slice of this material of a fixed volume V. And I'm saying, what's the probability now in this volume V that I've found some flaw bigger than that, uh, bigger than that critical size, and that critical size is dependent on my far field applied stress. Yeah. So if I looked, if I had uh, different types of distributions of flaws, um, now say I had a very broad distribution, G, um, a. So if I had something where there was kind of an equal likelihood of finding a large and a big flaw, actually an equal likelihood of finding a large and a big flaw would be something flat, but then I would have nothing. Um, but if I had a very broad distribution of big and small flaws, there's if I, if I take any size thing, there's some likelihood of me finding a flaw of that size versus me having a, having a very narrow distribution of flaws. So if there was exactly one flaw size and one flaw type, this would be a wide distribution of flaws, and this is narrow. So like a like a single flaw size. So what we can do with this now is we can actually perform some experiments to see where, when and where <coughs> failure will occur. So now, in, in practice, what I do is I take, say, a fixed, uh, a fixed part of a fixed size, and I test that part over and over and over and over again. So let's say I have, uh, it's, it's common with something like a carbon fiber, so let's say I have I'm going to take some carbon fibers. Carbon fiber, uh, they all have approximately the same diameter or same radius. And I, I'm going to choose some fixed length. So then I have some fixed uh, volume, V naught. And I'm going to test these now. At uh, I'm going to test these. And I'm going to try to find when they're going to fail. So this is the probability of failure. Here, uh, my maximum probability or the maximum failure of all of them. I have I have one. So if all of them have failed, then I have a probability of one. Uh, and this is the stress now at failure, uh, or the the applied stress. Uh, past which parts have failed. So I could have some very low stresses. At, at, at very low applied stress, I'm not going to have anything. So nothing will have failed 
at some very low applied stress. When I get to some intermediate stress, I might have a couple fibers starting to ping. And so in mm -hmm. your uh, in your uniaxial or in the zero degree carbon fiber test, <coughs> when the fibers were aligned, you started hearing some pinging at fairly low stresses, even though the whole part didn't actually fail yet. This is that those carbon fibers starting to ping. <coughs> so even though you're at a low applied stress, you can still hear some, you can still see some failure happening. In, a, in an actual experiment, you would do this with individual fibers instead of a, a toe or a, a whole bundle of them. Um, but it's the same general idea. So you have some failure, fibers failing at a low stresses. Um, eventually you get to some stress where a lot of them start to fail. And then some of them may, may keep surviving well after uh, that kind of stress where most of them will fail. And so you get this sort of an S-shaped distribution, uh, which now I'm going to draw a line through. And so eventually it tails off. So if I, if I get to, to some very high applied stress, all of them will have failed um, so I, by the time I'm applying like a five gigapascals or 10 gigapascals of stress, all of them will have failed. But then now there's some intermediate stress where say like half of them have failed. And in our YVO model, this is what we're gonna call our, our reference stress. So the stress at which half of the materials, half of the parts have failed for now a fixed volume. And the reason we want a fixed volume is because of this idea of, um, of distribution of flaws. So if I have, if I'm taking a bigger volume, there's a bigger distribution, I'm taking more, more of the sample, so I'm, I'm potenti I potentially have more flaws inside. Technically, this also means if I have an infinitely large part, um, I'm always going to get some very large flaw that's going to cause failure. Um, so if I take a part that's, I don't know, 100 meters across, for the carbon fiber composite, yes, it does. Okay. But I, I'm, that's something you've all seen now. In, in practice, you would be taking individual fibers and, and pulling them until they break. Okay. Um, yeah. So this, is, this would be like individual fiber tests. And you would get oh, a this is, yeah, like twenty trials of this single fiber. Yeah, and the more trials you do, the better distribution you'll get because the more data you'll have for what stresses they break at. What does it say on the vertical axis corresponding to sigma? Uh, F. Uh, no, so oh, 0.5. oh, 0.5. Oh, okay. so yeah, yeah. 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 Zero point five. One half of them have failed. There we go. I should probably be writing a little bit bigger. Is this method used uh, in improvement with imaging technologies or um, in lieu of them? Normally it's used in lieu of um, <coughs> So this, if you have a batch of, it's, it's hard and time consuming to do these sort of do image scans of all the parts. Um, and even then you're, you're sampling a small volume so if you want a representative volume, you have to do lots and lots and lots of scans, which takes lots of time, which inevitably, inevitably costs lots of money. So this is a, a faster and easier way to do um, a, a probing of, of what flaw sizes you potentially have in the material. To some degree, but a lot less so because, so, so it will, so th this is a good question. So in, in your tension experiments that you did, some of the parts you saw failing at slightly different yield strengths, some of them you saw had different ultimate strengths. There's a reason for that, and that reason is the distribution and in initial imperfections in your materials. But in a ductile material, because after the initiation of failure, you have a lot of plasticity, you see it manifest as slight variations in the exact yield strength of the material. So it, an, an initial flaw doesn't necessarily cause catastrophic failure. It can if it's really big and you're, you have that AC beyond the critical stress for fracture for the material. But most of the time, the, the flaws are small enough that it'll, you'll just have plastic deformation and then eventually fracture. 
and that eventually fractures that jagged surface you see in the neck region. Um, and that does uh, affect the, particularly the ultimate strength. So that's why I think one of your aluminum samples failed at like half of the ultimate or uh, the ultimate strain, sorry. One of your aluminum samples failed at half the ultimate strain as the other ones for some <laughs> labs, maybe. Um, and so that would be the reason, is there, there happened to be a big flaw somewhere in that necking region. Um, and so that, that acted as a failure nucleation site. But it's not quite as dramatic as with a brittle material. Cool. More questions? Okay. So when we, once we have this type of a failure plot, so this, uh, this sigma naught is now that stress when, when <coughs> half the parts have failed. Uh, parts have failed for uh, some given part size, so some given v naught. Um, v that, so this is now our reference volume, this is a reference stress. Now, this isn't a particularly useful curve to look at, um, so I'm gonna show you now a reorganization of this equation. So, uh, and this is how, how it's often plotted out. So, I'm gonna take that F is one minus EXP of minus V over V naught, sigma over sigma naught to the M. I'm gonna say this is the natural log of um, one minus F is equal to minus V over V naught, uh, sigma over sigma naught to the M. And then I'm going to take another log, so I've, I've moved stuff around. Uh, I'm going to take another log, natural log of natural log of 1 minus f is equal to now natural log of v over v naught. Um, if I move that, oh, uh, right. Uh, I'm going to move this negative over. And if I have uh, negative, I can bring that negative in and, and flip the sign of this. So this is one minus F to the negative one, which is the same as one over one minus F. There we go. That's how I get rid of the negative there. Um, this is now natural log of V over V naught plus M natural log of sigma over sigma naught. So this is slightly convoluted, but um, the reason we do this is now we have sum y equals m, uh, I guess, b plus mx. So now I have a linear equation, um, which is a lot easier to, to look at and analyze. So I'm going to take that y equals mx plus b form, plot this out, and now I'm going to take this failure data that I had initially and rework it uh, in terms of this reorganized equation. On my x-axis, I now have natural log of natural log of one over one minus f. Here, I have the natural log of sigma over sigma naught. Uh, and what I end up with, approximately, is something on a straight line with now a slope m. So this m is known as my Weibull modulus. And this defines effectively how random my part is. So if I have a very narrow or very large M, if I have like one M that these things fail at, or one, one stress that these things fail at, as, as my M goes to some very <coughs> large number, that means I have exactly one flaw size. So if in, if in my random part, in my random distribution of flaws, I have that one flaw size, that one critical, that one A that exists everywhere in the thing, that's gonna be where failure happens all the time. And so I'll get something that's, that's almost straight up and down. This is an infinity. 
But if I have an incredibly wide distribution, if I if I don't know what my distribution of flaws is, I could have an M that's that's very low, and this could my part could fail randomly at any applied stress. From an engineering context, we actually want something with a higher Weibull modulus. Um, and who, I guess, why why might we want something with a higher Weibull modulus? Because you can, yeah, exactly. So for engineering materials, it doesn't necessarily matter if we have an incredibly potentially strong and tough material, if it also could statistically be a garbage material. I want something that I know exactly what the properties are going to be, and I know exactly where it's going to fail all the time. And so the higher the Weibull modulus, the better. Generally, like in terms of actual numbers, um, if I have a Weibull modulus like less than five, this is kind of a, a bad material. Material. Or uh, with a wide distribution of flaws. Distribution. And if I have an M that's like greater than 10, this would be a good material. Um, with kind of a more narrow distribution of flaws. And this distribution of flaws depends on both what the material is and the way that it's been processed. Um, and so there's a couple interesting things that I want to discuss now. Um, so first I want to note that as the volume of the part increases, the probability of failure also increases. So for for bigger parts, uh, we're more likely to fail. There we go. And so this has some interesting implications when we start playing with nanomaterials. So first, when my computer wants to start up, here we go. This is incredibly annoying. I don't know why it always goes to this. Um, so first, there's there's an app that I found somewhere online. How many of you know Wolfram Alpha or Wolf Mathematica? Okay, I would hope so at this point. If you don't, it's incredibly useful. Please figure out what it is and use it all the time. Um, but Wolfram have a, has a demonstration project where they actually look, they take some common engineering materials and they look at that probability distribution. So this is the F versus sigma, so the probability of failure versus the stress. And they have a little um, slider module where you can change what uh, the M and the critical stress value are, sigma naught, so that, that average failure strength of the material, uh, to see how good or how bad a material is. So if I click on silicon nitride, it pulls up some actual silicon nitride data. Eventually, it's kind of a slow, oh, let's, let's reboot this. There we go. So you can see if you vary n or vary sigma, how you change these curves. So now if I look at silicon nitride data, uh, this has the references, I think, somewhere for where they're getting this data. Um, so I, I think they're from some papers somewhere. So this is now, uh, I know, just some papers. So now if I change my Weibull modulus, change my failure strength. This is silicon nitride. I don't know if you can see exactly what those slider values are. Um, but this is now uh, a Weibull modulus of 10, 11, and that's giving me a reasonably good fit uh, and a critical stress of uh, 9, 984, so, so almost, a, a, almost a gigapascal for silicon nitride. But you can see there's some material, some, some of these parts will fail at stresses of 700 MPa, and some of them will fail at stresses over 
a gigapascal. And so this, this distribution of flaws is what we're looking for in these brittle materials to figure out how likely failure is going to be. Um, if I look at, I think one of the particularly bad ones was tungsten carbide, um, which is incredibly strong but incredibly random. Um, so I think, there we go. This has a Y modulus closer to like five-ish, um, but an average critical stress. There we go. Something like that. A little bit less. Yeah, close enough. Um, so this this has an average critical stress now of, of 1600, so 1.6 gigapascals, but it has a Y modulus of like five. So that means some of these parts could fail at uh, almost two and a half gigapascals, but some of them could fail at less than a gigapascal. So even though this is an incredibly strong, tough material on an engineering side, you then have to make some assumptions and some approximations for, um, for or to, to accommodate how likely it is for a part to fail. So now if you make, say, tungsten carbide break disks, actually normally they're silicon carbide. Um, what does tungsten carbide get used for? There's something, filaments? I think light bulb filaments. I know they're tungsten. I don't know if they're tungsten carbide. I don't know. If you were to make a tungsten carbide something, you'd then have to say, all right, if I make a thousand of these parts, what's the likelihood of failure um, where for, for the operating life of this part where half of them are going to have failed or where 10% of them are going to have failed or say you're working in some advanced technology application like spacecraft, um, you, you want a 0.01% chance of failure of your parts. So then you have to over-design your parts to ensure that for whatever part sizes you have or however many of these things you're making, you ensure that low probability of failure. So this is where um, statistics is actually incredibly important for engineering, and it's because of this idea that you don't always know everything that's going on, but you can get an idea of statistically what might happen. And so uh, particular, this is particularly pronounced for brittle materials. Um, yeah, so I, I think this is a nice demonstration of, of that idea. So I'll, yeah. Uh, how often is the Weibull uh, module linearly versus like, uh, you know, before doing the math and having an exponential sort of uh, most, most of the time it's plotted as that log log versus log plot. Okay. Is there even a, a double log log plot? Is that a name? Of <laughs> yeah, it's a really weird metric. But most of the time it's plotted there okay. just so you can see that slope of the M. And this is, it's the, this Weibull modulus concept was actually developed um, by a guy in, in 1951, I think. Um, and I'll, I'll post the paper for that. Um, oh, I have the paper right here. <laughs> Waladi Weibull um, from Sweden. Waladi, W. W. Weibull, um, Swedish dude. So he came up with this statistical distribution idea of a Weibull modulus. He goes through this idea of chains breaking, shows how, shows how some of that math works, um, and then shows different applications for it. So this is now yield strength. This is distribution size distribution of fly ash. Um, this is uh, strength of cotton. Um, this is length of length of some. I don't even know. Sertoidea sample. Sertoidea. I have no idea what that is. Um, but I'll I'll post a link. <laughs> I'll I'll post a link to this paper so you can see it. And I'll post a link. I know, because I'm sure you're really eager to read it. <laughs> Just some light reading over holiday. I need a break from this lab. Well, hey. well, so it's somewhere down the line. You may be working with brittle materials, and you may really want to know how Weibull distributions work. Or if you ever go to grad school and you end up working on a, a project where this is relevant. <laughs> uh, um, but this. I'll, I'll post both the link for this uh, Wolfram demo and for this Weibull paper um, on the on Canvas. So there's one other interesting, uh, not caveat, interesting application for this, 
So because as the because the failure of a material is dependent now on the volume of the parts, that's also uh, it also works the other way where if you have smaller parts, they're less likely to fail. So that works at any scale. If you have uh, a, say some carbon fiber, silicon nitride fiber, or whatever, and you reduce the diameter, it's going to be statistically stronger. And so the smaller you can make those fibers, the stronger generally they're going to be. And there's an extreme limit of this where, ha, huh, published in extreme mechanics letters, even. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a good paper. Uh, I, have, I have a review paper with this guy, Jens Bauer. He was at KIT. So he did these, these tensile tests now, indirect push to pull on, uh, this is now ALD coated polymer. So he was able to get uh, alumina, so aluminum oxide uh, that was as small as about 10 nanometers, uh, coated on these things, tested them in compression, and started finding now, uh, eventually, there we go, uh, when you have, say, bulk alumina, uh, so large scale, you're some, you have some low average strength, less than a gigapascal. As you reduce that strength, you get this statistical increase. Uh, so as you reduce that volume, you're statistically getting stronger and stronger up until a point where you reach the theoretical yield strength of a material. So that's the strength at which atoms rupture. So I had mentioned that, I think, sometime maybe last week. Um, but so if you make your part small enough, this, this point happens around 20 nanometers, um, but you actually get to the point where your materials will be the theoretical strength of the materials statistically. Um, and that's because you're reducing the size of the part so much that there just can't be any flaw bigger than a certain size in it. And so you get something that's close to that theoretical strength. Now, the reason this is interesting is because this is the stuff that I do. So, <laughs> so we actually make uh, nano structures. So we have a nano 3D printer here on campus, actually down in the, in the WNF, the Washington Nano Fabrication Facility, the clean room. And we make uh, particularly lattice structures out of these ultra thin films. Uh, and so we had kind of postulated that um, this, there was this idea of viable strengthening of materials where you would see this. Uh, so we, we tested out these materials and we saw very high strengths to failure for them. And we postulated that it was because of this idea of a, of a viable distribution of strengths for brittle materials. And that we were actually somewhere below this critical transition where uh, you're getting to the theoretical strength of the materials. And that was sometime a couple of years after we did that, this article was published showing experimentally, yeah, you are. You're getting toward that theoretical strength of the materials. And so when you start making these nano material, nano architected materials, this is my research, um, you can start getting some really interesting phenomena. So this, uh, this is now that same aluminum oxide, alumina, so a brittle ceramic material. When you have it above a certain size, uh, it, it behaves brittly and ductily, uh, or brittly and fails catastrophically. And when you actually reduce the size, you can start in inducing uh, instabilities into the deformation. So shell buckling, like this type of a paper wrinkling, you can actually get that to happen with ceramic sheets if they're a couple nanometers thick. And so we were getting ductile and recoverable metamaterials made out of ceramics because we were causing them to shell buckle. And the reason we were able to do that is because they were gigapascals uh, in strength with theoretically no fault, no flaws in them. How often does this change depending on like uh, things like atomic uh, decay or quantum tunneling or other like atomic sort of factors and stuff? So mechanics uh, is slightly different than, so, so a lot of the quantum effects have to do with electronics and optics and heat transport. Um, mechanically, you're looking at how atoms interact and how grains interact with each other. So it's much more about structure than it is about quantum effects. Um, but there's there's a whole body of literature on molecular dynamic simulations and density functional theory simulations that use uh, Schrodinger's law to run simulations on atoms that I could talk to you for a while about. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Maybe. <laughs> so your iPhone can bounce. Um, 
No. So, so this this particular material, we're actually looking uh, into using it for shielding and engines. So, uh, the the actually the biggest problem with it is scaling it up. So right now we can make that much material, and we can't make you know a piece of material. That's a separate problem. Um, but technologically, there's a lot of interesting places where ceramics have utility but aren't used directly uh, in particularly high temperature applications and high radiation environments. So for example, the inside of a jet engine turbine, you want to get your maximum thermodynamic efficiency, you want your engine to run as hot as you can, but you have to make it not so hot that your materials melt. Um, and so you use some sort of a high temperature metal, a lot of them are nickel super alloys which maintain their strength at high temperatures. If you could use something like this, a ceramic that isn't brittle, for the shielding of an engine, you could then run at a higher temperature. Um, we're working with, or just starting something with Packar right now, uh, the truck company, for making a thermal swing coating in the inside of a, a piston housing. So for that, you want a material that's going to have ultra low thermal conductivity and also not carry any thermal mass, or not have any thermal mass. So you want it to, so when you have cool air coming in, you want that cool air to stay cool. And if your chamber heats up, then it heats up the cold air and ruins your thermodynamic efficiency. And so you want a material that doesn't have the heat transport through it, which is a ceramic, but you also don't want something that's going to carry any thermal, uh, any, any residual heat. So you want a porous ceramic, uh, a lightweight ceramic, it's mostly air, but you can't do that because ceramic foams are normally garbage materials. Um, so they're, they're incredibly brittle and fragile. But if you could make something that wasn't, it could change, uh, it could have a pretty big impact on those like industries. So for engines, it's been theorized like 8 to 10% bump in efficiency. Um, yeah, but that's kind of like a, an upper bound. So, so they're actually trying to get funding from the DOE right now on some super truck projects. Yeah, so it's fun stuff. Nanomaterials. We got like two minutes left. I'm happy to keep talking about stuff or just let you guys run. Uh, Do you have any, uh, I know you've shown us a few like short videos of some of your like, materials, but do you have any of this or is it all pretty much just like graphical data? No, I do. Um, <laughs> let's look at. <laughs> So this this is that brittle material, so the thick wall ceramic, and it is brittle and fails catastrophically. So that's kind of what you would expect there. But then there's a ductile version of that. There we go. So now this is that same material, same structure, uh, different wall thickness now. Ductily and actually recoverably. So, yeah, these are tests done in a scanning electron microscope with a with a nano indenter, so an in situ nano indenter, which we now have in the math. Uh, that was one of the fun new tools I got. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It is neat stuff. This is why engineering research exists. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good Thanksgiving. <laughs>